Well, why don't we go ahead and start because I know John has a, a hard stop and, and then we'll have our resource updates. And when Mayor Roberts comes on, we'll get him uh, here in a second. But um, again, thank you to uh, everyone for being with us today for our TAT chat. Hard to believe this is our final TAT chat of, of 2021. Uh, we've been doing this uh, since March of 2020. 20, uh, when the pandemic started, we started these, as many of you know, uh, with originally weekly, and then we went to twice a month. And uh, uh, starting last month, we've gone to once a month, and we will do these uh, once a month, beginning again in uh, 2022. So um, I want to thank and welcome everybody uh, for, for being with us today. And I see Mayor Roberts is... Uh, coming in now and we'll we'll give him a chance. Uh, Mayor Roberts is uh, uh, dubbed himself or been dubbed I think as our uh, COVID chair and uh, he really has been a, a great uh, leader with these uh, TAT chats and, and very dedicated to be part of this and and all the work with us and so Mayor before we turn it over to John I'll give you a chance to say a couple words and then we'll we'll get John Lummis on uh, for his uh, remarks. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Dean. And it's it's um, good to have everybody with us today. I in particular wanted to be on this one because I have one of my favorite people in the world, John Lummis. He's an Anderson boy. He's one of our guys, and we're proud of the work that he's doing, um, representing the entire upstate in his role as CEO of the upstate of South Carolina Alliance. And um, John um, lives in the city of Anderson. He's a city resident. He pays city taxes, and uh, we're proud to have him uh, in our community. So with that, I will turn it over to our buddy, John Lummis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I call him my mayor because he is my mayor. <laughs> I'm also my great friend. <laughs> also my great friend. So thank you, Mayor Roberts. I appreciate those kind words do a fantastic job as the mayor, and I try to cause as little problems as possible. <laughs> mayor, <laughs> mayor Roberts will be coming on the executive committee of the Upstate Alliance coming up at the beginning of next year, so thank you for him for that as well. So, John, we're, you're going in and out. I can't okay. hear you. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. I'll just talk louder. Okay, well, and thanks to Dean for uh, having me as a guest today. Um, Tent at the Top and the Upstate Alliance are great partners on many things and just appreciate all the work um, that you do, Dean. And thank you. Making things better all the time in the Upstate. So thank you and uh, appreciate our work in relationship. So um, I am the CEO and president of the Upstate Alliance. I've been in my role for about seven and a half, almost eight years. I am a native of Anderson, as the mayor said, and grew up in Anderson, still live there. Um, and, uh, but you know, the entire upstate region um, is our focus, okay? So I want to start talking a little bit about building relationships. Our organization, we're the marketing organization for economic development for the 10 upstate counties. And I've got a number of maps that you'll see in a minute, but basically it's the same footprint as 10 at the top. Um, and what we try to do is market the region to the world so new companies will consider and hopefully land um, in the upstate region. And we also do uh, talent recruitment, which I'm going to talk about later on in in the presentation, but you know, the heart of what we do is building relationships, and this is in our business recruiting. The way that we do that, we work a lot with site selectors, which are um, individuals or firms that are hired by companies to find new site locations. Um, this has always been important, and through the pandemic, actually has become more important. Um, we're seeing as much as 50% of our projects that are being led by site consultants. Um, and having relationships with those, these, these folks kind of narrows up the, the playing field down a little bit um, because they run with, again, lots of projects, and we want them to think about the upstate. 
We also work very closely with international trade offices like consul general offices um, of many countries. We had an event um, back during COVID. We had 19 um, different countries that participated in a virtual event from the international offices. And most of these that we work with are in Atlanta. Um, a lot of the ones that we have the best relationship with are um, in in Europe, Western Europe, but we have them all over the world. Also, you know, industry leaders are so important. A lot of these folks are our, um, our investors, is what we call folks that are members of our group, um, that are so important in, in what we do. And then the companies themselves. There's no better way um, to tell the story of the upstate than by a company that's come into the upstate and has been successful, like a BMW. Um, like a Michelin, um, smaller companies like a company called Posix that has been doing a lot of uh, marketing help for us recently uh, from Belgium. So um, again, we're about building relationships um, you know, in the upstate region, but also all over the world. Okay. Um, speaking of marketing, I, I love this statistic. You know, what we try to do is get the term upstate South Carolina noticed across the country and across the world. Um, so we had an increase of 22% um, on our searches of the term upstate South Carolina from December 2018 to December 2020. Um, I know a lot of people were sitting around at their computer at home during COVID. Hope that's not why we had more. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, we have had a lot more searches and I think that's because of our strategic um, marketing in regard to our digital presence. So 2021 has been a really good year. Um, 2020 was down, of course, because of COVID. Not a terrible year, but thus far, and this is uh, through the end of November, we've had 1.88 billion in new capital investment, about 6,400 jobs and 50 total announcements. There was another announcement yesterday called Transcom in Greenville County, and that's going to put that job number up, um, you know, additional 450 jobs. So we're having a good year um, in creating jobs. I think when, it, when it's all um, said and done, we will be well over $2 billion in investment. That will be an excellent year for the upstate region. Okay. So um, over, over the last uh, five years, about $8 billion in capital investment, about it's up actually about 25,000 new jobs across the region. And those are both new companies and existing companies that have, that have chosen to put a location in the upstate. So one of the, I want to talk about how we sell ourselves. Um, one of the biggest ways that we sell ourselves is regarding location. Um, Obviously, on the East Coast, halfway between Charlotte and Atlanta, halfway between New York and Miami, um, we're connected to the Port of Charleston, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. But really importantly, one day driving distance of um, 100 million, a little bit over 100 million people, which are 100 million consumers. As we have been in the pandemic, we've seen a lot of the supply chains are being broken. Um, it's becoming more and more important for companies that are particularly doing distribution um, to be closer to their markets. And if you're where we're located, you can be close to a lot of markets. Um, again, I show this map because one of the most important things is our infrastructure here um, in the upstate of South Carolina and South Carolina's old. I-85 is the business backbone of the southeastern U.S. Most but we're also blessed to have I-26, I-385. And then again, connectivity to the Port of Charleston and connectivity from the Port of Charleston by rail up to the inland port in Greece. So our ports are incredible. Um, you know, Charleston Port, uh, the deepening process they're going through right now um, is scheduled to be completed at the end of this year. It'll be into 2022, but we're going to be the deepest port on the East Coast, 52 and a half feet, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, and uh, we directly serve 150 nations. The Inland Port facility um, in, in Greer 
um, is basically what we call our 212 mile deep port facility. Um, it's a dedicated rail line from that inland port facility to the port of Charleston. Um, and what it does basically, number one, is it eliminates 50,000 truck trips a year on I-26, but it also makes for a more efficient route for goods and services to go from the to the port. Okay. And as you can see, uh, upstate, there are about 66,000 upstate jobs that are connected to goods being exported. Um, pretty incredible. South Carolina's number one exporter of passenger vehicles and tires and ball bearings are another one that we're the number one. And really interesting, we're, South Carolina's also the number one exporter of kazoos, you know, the little musical instrument that you I always love doing that just to see who's paying attention. But that's a true fact. She moved the slide on, I know. Um, airport access is so important for our international business and our domestic business. Um, Greenville Spartanburg Airport, fantastic airport. Um, it's been voted best uh, airport of its size in the country last year. But we also have the largest airport in the world uh, two hours down the road in Atlanta and one of the largest in the world in Charlotte right up the road. So we are connected by airport. GSP um, departures to 18 major cities. It's probably, I think, 19 now. Slide is a little bit older. But, um, and one of the things that we're really pushing right now is air cargo. Um, they built a 110,000 square foot air cargo facility, and we have numerous air cargo flights out of there each week, and we're getting more and more by the day. Okay. Just some statistics. Um, you know, another way we sell ourselves is the fact that we are a pro business environment. You can read these, but I mean, our state and the upstate region is constantly being um, noticed as a great place to do business, great government business relationships, and also incredibly fast growing state. Um, and the biggest thing that we run into now, every prospect asks for, is about workforce. Where do we get our workforce? How? Are they going to be able to hire these folks? Okay. Another way we sell ourselves is on the international companies that we have here. Uh, 545 international companies from 34 countries. Amazing number of these. Most all of those, uh, really all of those, have come since the late 60s to the upstate region. You know, we have 143 German companies. But if you look at those numbers, we have companies from all over the world. Um, Transcom that uh, announced yesterday is a Swedish company. You wouldn't think about it. We've got now 17 Swedish companies um, in the upstate region. So international companies love being here. They love doing business here. By the fact that so many of them have come here and been successful, we can get so many more. I um, mean, we have the number one highest concentration of jobs by foreign owned enterprises in the upstate of South Carolina. A couple other things that we talk a lot about um, we are a right to work state in South Carolina. We have the lowest rate of unionization um, of any state in the union, about 2.9%. We have a very competitive tax structure um, and also low cost of utilities um, overall for companies that are. Again, lowest unionization rate, I just said this, 2.9%. Um, and that is just incredibly important for companies looking from other parts of the U.S. and also foreign companies. Foreign companies do not deal with a union. Um, and many co domestic companies that are looking here are looking because they don't want to have to deal with it. So that is a very important thing that, uh, that we said. So... Our labor force in the upstate is about 700,000, 21,000 graduates from our post-secondary institutions. We have 2018 the upstate. Um, and net migration into the GSA uh, area, um, 
we are you know, very blessed to have a lot of people coming in here to work, okay? So about 2,043 manufacturers in the upstate region, which is pretty incredible. 111,000 people employed in, in advanced manufacturing. So we are a manufacturing region. I think that's what we can really sell ourselves on as we see more about innovation and technology the way that we can sell ourselves is we are an innovative, technology-driven manufacturing business. I'm going to talk just about one of our areas because we have five target areas, but automotive is one that is always very important. It's really interesting right now because of the electric vehicle technologies that we're seeing. Um, we're seeing BMW, Volvo, and you know the OEMs in the area or in the region going towards electric vehicles. And this is going to be a real revolution for us. And, you know, the automotive industry is going to continue to be very important through this revolution. Okay. Um, BMW, I think everyone knows this story, but, you know, 11,000 people working there, about 400,000 vehicles per year being produced and exported out of the Port of Charleston to about 140. Michelin, again, you know, started uh, doing manufacturing here in 1975, has continually um, expanded, put their North American headquarters here in 1988, um, employs more than 7,500 people in the upstate. Just an incredible company, incredible corporate citizen. So 20 OEMs in one day of driving distance from the upstate. Another amazing statistic that I love, there are more automotive suppliers and automotive OEMs within 500 miles of the upstate of South Carolina than within 500 miles of Detroit, Michigan. We are the center of automotive. Um, one of the things that drives this, we have about 2.7 times the national average in concentration of industrial engineers, um, which is huge. This is because we're a manufacturing region, many of the engineering firms located here because of the textile industry that is here and dominant. Um, and you know, we continue to grow the number of engineers. Our technical college system is, um, in my opinion, the best in the country. Um, I used to work at Tri-County Technical College for eight years and I know the importance of what, what it does for particularly our manufacturers but also businesses as, as a whole. And this is a big thing that we use to sell what we do. Quality of life obviously is, is huge for us. And I know that's something that Ten at the Top is working on every day, increasing our um, quality of life. But, you know, you see all of the accolades at York State. New York Times, when they say that Greenville is the 12th best place to go in the world, I mean, that's pretty good. Um, Spartanburg considered top 10 coolest town in America, and Welford, fifth most diverse place to live in South Carolina. Um, you know, my hometown and the mayor's hometown of Anderson was said yesterday to be one of the best places in the country for retirees to move and live. I mean, it's people want to be here, and our quality of life is in that. So, our target industries. Um, Aerospace, automotive, engineered materials, food manufacturing, and life sciences. These are what we focus our recruiting efforts on and our marketing efforts on. And those are the ones that are here. The clusters are here, but we can get more. Okay. The second thing that we're really working on is, is embracing innovation. As I mentioned earlier, we're a manufacturing region. But the way that we're going to be most successful in the future is to be the place where innovative manufacturers but also support industries of manufacturing that have innovation and technology are going to locate. So being an innovation economy is going to be key for us. What we've seen over the last 10 years is that we see smaller projects looking at our region. A lot of times the reason they're smaller is they are using this innovation technology. So we are retooling to try to find these smaller companies that want to locate in our region that generally pay more, 
and bring more value to their employees. One of the ways that we're doing this is our landing pad program that we've had for about the last five years. It really focuses on international companies that want to get a presence in the U.S. by starting a marketing operation, a small manufacturing operation, or a technology operation supporting some of our manufacturers. Um, and what we found is that these international companies really want to be here, but they don't know exactly how to, to, to put their location here. So what we try to do is help them with you know, getting in, connected with attorneys, getting in, connected with accountants, getting connected with staffing services, real estate options, really putting a lot of care into these projects to get them started. And we've had a number of these that we've been able to locate. Some of the spots, there are spots all over that they can locate. Um, you know, Spark Center in Spartanburg, um, location in Anderson that the county ends now at the um, old TTI facility, and many others around the region. These folks can get a start. Okay. Um, I talked a little bit about talent attraction and talent cultivation. This has gotten to be really, um, we have business recruitment, but talent attraction, recruitment, and cultivation has gotten to be just as important because companies are not going to locate in their region if they can't. So back in, I guess, 2018, um, 10 at the top, Upstate Alliance, and Greenville, Spartanburg, and Anderson Chambers, we started talking about how we could work together um, to try to do a talent attraction initiative. So we came together and we decided to do Move Up, which is basically a website that has information on businesses, on quality of life, on cost of living, anything you need to know about the upstate region, and then specific areas. But it also combines that with a job board and lead search engine that is focused on jobs in the upstate. So if you went in and put welding, you would find all the welding jobs in the upstate of South Carolina that would be available. Um, okay, you can go to the next. So we came up with move up when the unemployment rates were around 2%. When the pandemic hit and the unemployment rates went up to about 13%, we said, hey, maybe we need to focus a little bit on not necessarily attracting people from outside, but helping people that have either been unemployed or underemployed or are not in the job market for some reason during the pandemic to find jobs. So we started up Skill Up, which is really a subset of Move Up. What Skill Up does is it has you know, the same information, obviously, as Move Up, but if someone is looking for a job, they can go, again, put welder in. Um, if they're in Greenville County, um, it will send them to the Greenville Tech um, website and it will tell them what kind of certificate training they would need to be a welder and then connects them with that job. So connects them with the job, but also gives them the information um, that, you know, we can, um, that they can use to, to get the training that they need, um, get that job. So that's been very successful. And really, 2022 is going to be the year that we really roll out skill up. So that is all that I have um, right now, but I do see that I have some questions in the chat function. Dean, do you want me to go to those? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Amy Robichaud had a, a question yeah, okay. about the move up um, specific areas of the country. Are you targeting certain areas? Certainly during the pandemic, I know in talking with Tiffany uh, uh, earlier this week about um, the strategy, you guys have not necessarily yeah. um, focused as much right now, but, you know, are there particular areas that, that you are going to focus on uh, once uh, people are moving again and move up uh, becomes, you know, back to being kind of a critical a talent attraction site? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, as we started Move Up, we um, had a consultant that we worked with called DCI, and we identified uh, 10 specific cities, you know, geographies around the country. Um, and they would be the ones that you would probably figure. Um, 
Detroit, areas in California, Texas, places like that. Um, we are in the process of expanding that to 20 locations that we're going to target. Um, and, you know, one of our partners and what we're doing is Greenville today. If y'all are familiar with that, group, it's going to be, I think they're in 24 cities now. A lot of our cities are, are, are similar cities to theirs because they're the ones that are high growth, but also have some things about them that, that people may want to, to move and look for jobs in the next uh, John, we have another question okay. from, from Antoinette uh, regarding healthcare industry. Um, how does it measure up in the upstate? Is there a growth of health promotion interventions or wellness centers uh, from both the corporate uh, and freestanding? I don't okay. know if that's... Exactly. I'm not an expert on this one. I can I can make something up, but um, no, I, I will say that our healthcare providers here in the Upstate are, are fabulous. We have, you know, AnMed is one of our board members. Uh, Prisma is one of our um, uh, investors, and uh, Bon Secours Mercy is one of our board members. So we have excellent healthcare. From the um, business recruitment side, I think that it's always very much of a positive about our healthcare system. You know, we we have strong health care all over the area. Um, so, I mean, that's a real positive. And I'm sorry I can't answer more about that question. Um, John, Aaron Oots uh, asked a question about, is there anything the uh, uh, upstate entrepreneurial ecosystem can do to support the locally owned businesses that make a location more attractive to companies you recruit? Definitely. And part of our innovation um, initiative that we're working on involves really entrepreneurship and growing businesses in the upstate region um, for success. And I think the upstate entrepreneur ecosystem is very important to that. You know, we're working with Next. We're working with a number of other um, groups that are supporting Thurman University, Clemson, others that are supporting entrepreneurship. It's got to be a complete ecosystem. I think y'all's initiative has been great in bringing together the players that we can be successful. But, you know, really what we've got to do moving forward is continue to recruit business, continue to recruit talent, but grow these businesses from within the region that are going to be successful moving forward. As well. So, John, you know, having been housed in your office for uh, almost a decade before we, uh, we were able to get our own space, I learned quite a bit from, from you and all of your team. And one of the things I heard a lot of uh, about is the, the importance uh, of having product, having, um, and, and also having, you know, the right you, um, uh, infrastructure for uh, your community. Uh, where do we stand, and I'll let you get out on this one, because I know you, you need to head to Columbia. How do we look as a region in terms of our, our product and our infrastructure for companies that are looking to come here? To the region? Yeah, well, you know, if you'd have asked me that question about two years ago, I'd have said, God, we got so much product, you know, there's there's space all over. That's not the case now. Um, you know, a lot of, of the product that we saw um, in Spartanburg County that was built for, um, particularly for um, the e-commerce type groups, that, that's getting gobbled up. Um, and it seems like any spec building that is built on I-85 gets bought before it's finished. Um, so we, we do not, we need more product. We need more product across the board, both from private sector investors um, doing it and from public you know, sector groups doing it. Now, that being said, we've had a huge increase in the number of national developers that are looking at our region to do just that because they know that there now is somewhat of a scarcity. Um, product is important. One thing I'll say about infrastructure, I do want to applaud Tim at the top for their efforts regarding mobility. That is going to be such a huge thing for us moving forward. How are we going to continue to be able to get goods and services up and down the road um, for, you know, for companies to be successful? I mean, I-85, if anybody drives between Spartanburg and Greenville in the afternoon, you know, we, we've got to start figuring out some ways that we can um, have other routes and other ways for people to do that. So that's going to be a huge thing for us is particularly that road infrastructure. Great. Well, John, thank you. I know uh, you need to head on to uh, 
uh, uh, Columbia, but thank you so much for, for your presentation today and for uh, the work and the partnership we have with the Upstate Alliance. I think, uh, you know, it, it is, I know when I got here 12 years ago, people asked the question, well, what's the difference between the Upstate Alliance and Ten at the Top? And I think uh, it's become more clear, you know, that we're an internal product development and you guys are, are relationship building, but also the external marketer. And I think we've uh, found a good way to collaborate. And I think, you know, uh, the Upstate is stronger because of our organizations, because of the economic development organizations in the various counties and, and many others. And so uh, it's exciting to hear, you know, the continued growth and, and the, the energy around, um, you know, bringing additional jobs uh, to this region. Uh, now, of course, uh, we have to, as you said, continue to grow the infrastructure and the product and all these other pieces uh, to keep this a great place uh, for people uh, to live and to, to raise a family. So uh, be safe on your trip to Columbia and we will look forward uh, to engage with you again uh, moving forward. All right, Thank, thanks again for the opportunity and um, y'all have a great day and I'll be glad to come back anytime and speak to the group. Thank you very much. And I, All right. think, I think Tiffany was on and Tiffany, if you would put the, the move up link in chat for people uh, to be able to find that page if they are not familiar with move up, I think that would be uh, really good for, for folks. And that is a very dynamic website. We're in the process of, of, and we've talked about this for a while, creating a teach at the top um, website with uh, public education partners in the school districts to help with the teacher shortage. And when we uh, were looking at the quality of life component of, of that product, we didn't have to do any of the work. We just made links to uh, the move up site because it is so thorough and does such a great job. So uh, Tiffany, thank you for putting that in. If you, and for those on the call, if you have not uh, seen the move up page, you can, you can check it there. So we're gonna pivot um, very quickly. I wanna talk about a couple things we have coming up between now and the end of the year. Um, first, next week, we have our last uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem session. Um, this is gonna be at Ogletree Deacons. Uh, it is a, a, a great um, opportunity for anyone, whether you're, involved in uh, entrepreneurship or just want to understand more about uh, uh, business law and uh, things happening for employers, uh, Michael Nail uh, gives a great presentation of, uh, to this group every year. And uh, you're all welcome to come to that. And um, uh, Lena or Justine, if you can put that link into the website. And we are also going to have a, a reception. So it's a great opportunity to network with others in the community. That's coming up next Tuesday, uh, I believe, uh, the 7th, correct, Justine? And then uh, I am very excited about a new partnership uh, that we have uh, with the Urban League of the Upstate beginning next year. Many of you were part of the TAT Reconnect sessions that we did this, uh, this year, um, you know, getting back to uh, being in person in small groups. And next year, we're actually partnering with the Urban League for these sessions. We're gonna do two a month. Uh, one each month will be here in our um, building in this, the large uh, community room here. And then the second one each month uh, will be in a different county. Uh, so um, stay tuned. Each one will again be about a different topic. And uh, we're really excited about that. And I think it will uh, continue to be a way to build relationships and to talk about of key issues in the upstate region. So uh, with that, I will turn it over, Justine, to you, and you can introduce our resources. Thank you very much. Um, there, was a, there was an article recently about uh, two organizations that are supporting Afghan immigrants, uh, refugees to the upstate. And so we have our first two resource updates, our organization supporting that, and then we'll follow that with uh, Circles Greenville. So let's start with B Badrija. She's allowed me to only pronounce her first name for today. I'm doing baby steps. Badrija uh, will speak for a couple minutes and then Brandon with World, Re World Relief Upstate. But Badrija is with Lutheran Services Carolinas. Well, good afternoon. And uh, um, I really appreciate an opportunity to be a guest today and just give you a quick update of what is going on with Lutheran Services Carolinas 
and the reopening of the Refugee Resettlement Office in Greenville. Um, as some of you may know, Lutheran Services Carolinas is a faith-based uh, Lutheran church affiliated organization that is providing an array of services. But one service that we're talking about today is the Refugee and Immigrant Services. Um, in 2017, we had closed the program, um, the Refugee Resettlement Program in Greenville after being in the upstate for almost 15 years. Um, the large Ukrainian community that is in the, in the upstate is um, um, partly um, been resettled and established with the help of Lutheran Services um, and there. What we are doing now is reopening the program um, to resettle refugees through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, which is approved by the Bureau for Population, Refugee and Migrations. And we have proposed and are approved to resettle about 100 refugees from all over the world. One, um, the evacuation of the Afghans after the fall of Kabul happened in August, the ref settlement agencies were called to um, help uh, the resettlement of Afghans who are currently stationed and are staying at um, eight uh, military bases across the US. So we responded to that call and uh, proposed to serve about 100 individuals, and that number includes um, children, families. N total number is about 100 that we will see uh, coming to Greenville area, hopefully starting in January of 22. Our services will include case management and ensuring that the individuals are placed in a, in a safe and in a good environment. We're going to uh, also provide employment services. Um, the initial employment services are um, about eight months, but we are able to uh, work with the Department of Social Services and secure additional funding to provide an ongoing extended case management and employment services. So um, yes, we uh, as a resettlement agency are uh, uh, hoping to offer safe and welcoming home in Greenville County for the refugees and, um, and Afghans um, who are being resettled in the area. But we're also hoping to be able to um, help them become self-sufficient through employment very quickly. So they um, are able to start a new life and uh, be definitely off the public assistance in a very short period of time. Um, currently, uh, we have programs uh, in, in Colombia, and uh, the employment rate is 100% within, within 180 days. So that's what we're hoping uh, to do in Greenville, and that's why I'm very excited to uh, be on this call and hearing about all these opportunities for uh, newcomers uh, in Greenville County. Um, with that, I think think that I'm going to close what, what another aspect of the resettlement there is engaging local communities with uh, um, refugees resettling the area through a circle of welcome program, which is um, in, engaging local churches, faith organization and community groups in an organized way to work with the Lutheran services and the families. So if uh, we're also recruiting volunteers um, and other support uh, locally. So I am going to leave my contact information in the chat room if people are interested in learning more uh, about the resettlement um, opportunities to connect and engage with us as we reopen our office there January 1st. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's, um, it's inspiring, inspiring news. And if you will put your contact information in the chat, I will also put a link to the, our blog on our website that has the e-newsletter articles from Lutheran Services and also from World Relief Upstate. And Brandon is going to talk a bit about what they are up to next. Brandon? 
Yeah, thanks uh, again um, for inviting us and for highlighting this important topic uh, of refugees. I do think because of the current you know, Afghan crisis and, and looking at how we can support Afghans, both those who were supporting our troops for so many years and other vulnerable Afghans, um, you know, that's been the focus and that's good because it is the most kind of urgent situation right now, but it highlights a much broader refugee crisis that is going on. So World Relief uh, is a Christian international humanitarian organization. We work all over the world. Uh, but in the United States, we do focus specifically on uh, refugee resettlement and supporting immigrants. Um, and we have 17 offices around the country. And so the office that we have here in the upstate in Greenville, we resettle refugees to um, Greenville and Spartanburg counties and to the general upstate area. Uh, our office did open in 2015. And since that time, we have um, helped to resettle over 500 uh, refugees. And when we talk about refugees, we like to just, it might be um, common knowledge to many, but we like to just clarify who we're talking about. You know, so these are individuals and families that had to flee persecution. Uh, so they're not just people that are looking for a, a, a change in their life or a better paying job, but these are people who had a well-founded fear of persecution for their faith, for their ethnicity, for their gender, and they leave their home country and then they seek asylum in other countries. And so uh, part of that refugee journey is going through a very extensive vetting background process where, um, you know, first the UN and the UNHCR uh, conduct those background checks and health screenings, and then the U.S. government uh, will do the same. And once they go through that, the U.S. government will invite them to come and rebuild their lives here. And all of that typically is with off, you know, offshore um, vetting and processing. Um, and we just highlight that because it, it, it shows how vulnerable many of these individuals and, and community members are that are coming in um, and, and kind of the journey that they've been through and the privilege that it is to be part of a group that welcomes them and um, builds that supportive welcoming community for them here. You know, recently we had a number of uh, Congolese uh, coming in and the average wait time before they arrived in the U.S., but since they left their home country was 16 years. And so uh, there's, there's a significant need there. Um, we haven't worked with a lot over the past couple of years resettling, but with changes in policies um, and um, administrations, then we are looking at an increase in the number of people coming in. Um, and, you know, just over the past um, three or four months, we've had the privilege of um, bringing in um, 60, around 60 uh, refugees, including Afghans, for the first time to the upstate. Um, and, you know, also working uh, with them to get them connected to services. A lot of the services that uh, Lutheran Services provides uh, mirror uh, what we also provide. So we um, go from case management, which would include identifying affordable housing and helping them get set up with that, even furnishing the house, uh, connecting them with social services. And um, then from that point, uh, providing you know, job readiness, uh, support, job placement and referrals. And, and like was reported, it, it's, um, they are self-sufficient very quickly given what you know, the challenges that they've overcome to get here. Uh, we find that um, you know, employers are very eager and, and happy to work with them. They're eager to work and become self-sufficient. And we see that time and time again with, our, with uh, the people coming through our office. Um, but maybe one of the most important things that we do is by uh, providing um, a community that supports them. And we have a number of uh, partnerships with churches. Our primary partners are churches in the area, um, but also businesses and community groups where these groups will pull together what we call good neighbor teams. And they will focus on helping with um, learning English, with homework tutoring for children, and with just building those friendships to where these families can feel like they're really home and they're in a place that uh, they belong to. Um, and we really just appreciate the diversity and the, um, the unique opportunity that it brings to the upstate and to people that are already here. Um, so that's the work that we do, and, and uh, we also do work in education, um, having uh, connecting with local schools, partnering with them, making sure that 
you know, teachers are informed of the students they're receiving, that parents are informed, and that students are really set up for success. And all of that just goes in, uh, just feeds into the successful integration that we see time and time again with the refugees that are coming in. Thank you so much. And also, if you would want to put your uh, contact information in the chat, if anyone would like more information or uh, would like to get involved with your organization. And um, Justine, before you move on, Amy had a really good question in the oh, chat. If you want to sure. take that. Um, Amy is looking for primary needs your organizations are seeking and the gaps that you see in our communities and she would like to know as individuals how we could assist. Speak to that. Um, the primary need at this time is affordable housing. Um, we know that we're all facing the housing crisis nationwide and the Greenville is not an exception to it. Uh, finding uh, housing that is um, affordable to our clients and that is uh, located cl close to the public transportation system um, is critical at this time for us. That's a primary need for us at the moment. How can you as an individual have help? Um, uh, there are different ways. I spoke about the circles of welcome, uh, sharing information within your network about the um, uh, refugee resettlement in the area, uh, sharing uh, who the refugees are. So people um, are familiar with, the, with uh, who the individuals are and not be afraid of that. Um, what other needs we have, um, connections to employers. Our goal is to get people employed as soon as possible. Our clients are eager. We just need employers who are willing to uh, um, given an opportunity to um, clients that we serve. Brandon, did you have anything? Uh, yeah, I would say that, you know, very similar uh, needs that, you know, refugees um, have here. And as we work to support them, similar needs in our office, um, you know, housing absolutely is, you know, the top concern. And we have a number of people that come in and unfortunately, you know, we're not able to put, put them into long term solutions right away. So they end up in um, kind of temporary housing until we're able to find that long term solution. Um, so connections to, you know, people in the affordable housing sector um, are always welcome and people that are interested in just kind of entering uh, into that dialogue and, and looking for um, healthy solutions for refugees coming in. Um, you know, there's also, you know, the need for advocacy uh, as there's an increase in the number of people coming in, you know, really just highlighting uh, the, the positive benefits uh, to our community as a welcoming community and how we can see our own, uh, our own growth and our own diversity increase through that and the richness that that brings. Um, and also, you know, advocating, uh, you know, to local officials and, and, and showing our support for this. Un unfortunately, many times, um, read the refugee issue is politicized and, and um, it becomes a heated topic. And so just showing that, you know, there is a broad support. And honestly, we've been overwhelmed by the amount of support that we have received from churches, from um, businesses and from other groups. And so just highlighting that support uh, so that we can, can uh, create a more welcoming community. And then, you know, as there's an increase in the number of um, Refugees coming, there's always a need for additional resources and funding um, and, and volunteers. So like we have the Good Neighbor teams looking for people that are willing to come and walk alongside refugees as they rebuild their lives here. Um, and so anyone that's interested in specific opportunities with that, all of that's kind of laid out in our website. I'll post it um, in the chat box here. Thank you so much. Thanks for your question, Amy. Okay, let's hear from uh, Mr. Tommy Sinclair from the Circles Program in Greenville. Hey, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak with you. So my name is Tommy Sinclair. I'm uh, the president of Engineered Products. We're a manufacturing company uh, here in Greenville. I'm also a member at uh, Buncombe Street United Methodist Church, where I led our, um, as a lay leader, our mission uh, and outreach committee for several years. Um, I mentioned both of those because where those two kind of converge is the reason that I'm speaking with you today. I'm also the co-chair for our planning team for uh, Greenville, Circles of Greenville County. 
So uh, you're probably not familiar with circles. Um, uh, when I talk about circles, I always like to mention that we live in a uh, in a an amazing community, as you heard John talk about, and as I hear uh, Brandon and Bedrizia talk about their the, the success that they've seen in their organizations. You recognize that we live in an amazing uh, community. It is a community that is rich with uh, with help and support. Um, you know, whether it's church groups or other community um, programs, or whether it's um, agencies in in the area that are that are built to help people that are experiencing poverty or that are that are in need. Um, we, we have a wealth of resources. What we found at um, as we were working through some of these opportunities, local opportunities to um, for folks in poverty in uh, in the community, what we found as a church is that a lot of these, most of these agencies that are here to help, um, are really built to support people that are experiencing moments of crisis. So uh, whether it be um, needs for um, immediate housing, whether it be support for uh, utilities. Um, whether it be um, short-term child care issues, um, 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 career advancement, those types of things. A lot of the issues that, 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 that the agencies around uh, our community are built to help with are crisis. And so one of the questions we were asking ourselves is how do we move beyond that moment of crisis to help people completely emerge from poverty, right? So, so that is what Circles is. Circles is built to eradicate poverty. That's our sole mission. And the way it works is the way we, we um, the, uh, the the initiative works is that we partner um, basically middle income folks with folks that are experiencing poverty. Most of the folks that we're working with um, um, that are experiencing poverty are uh, are a product of generations of of, of poverty. Um, and so the, we're working with people that are experiencing poverty that have um, chosen to to emerge from poverty to to lead their family out of poverty. So we call those folks leaders. They're leading their family out of poverty. We partner those with middle income folks that are um, that we call allies. And so what happens is we train both the, the leaders and the allies in a 12 week training program. And then we match them um, in what we call circles, a matched circle. So that's where the, the, the initiative gets its name. And we, we partner two allies, two to three allies for every one leader. And they both commit to an 18 month relationship. That 18 month relationship comes on the heels of the 12 week training, uh, training that they've just come through. Um, and so essentially what we're asking the leader is when you imagine yourself, your, your life, when you've emerged from poverty, what does it look like? When you imagine your career, when you imagine your, your housing situation, your transportation, what, what do you imagine that might look like? And we ask them to put that on paper. And then over that 18 month relationship, the allies simply walk beside uh, the, the leader as they go step by step through a plan to help um, realize that, um, that, that dream that they have of, of, uh, of emerging from poverty. So um, certainly it's not easy. Um, uh, that's why we have 12 weeks of, of training because um, even some of the, the basic um, decision-making and, and basic um, uh, you know, uh, thought processes that would go into that planning are, are foreign um, to, the, to the leader. Um, and then some of the um, challenges that the leader are facing that are very practical, very realistic um, for somebody experiencing poverty are foreign to the allies. So it's important that we, we give them both um, you know, sort of level set the, the experiences of both that they can come on, on more even playing uh, to a more even playing field as they as they partner together. Um, but so over that 18 months, uh, obviously, they become um, friends. We, in fact, we call this an intentional friendship. Um, there is not a financial support that's asked for um, the allies. In fact, we specifically discourage it because we don't want um, that to become a, um, you know, a, 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 a regular um, enabling type situation, what we really want to do is, is through that intentional friendship, help them work their plan. Um, so we see some amazing results. We see increases in income. We see uh, increases in housing stability, in um, reliable transportation, uh, in career development. Um, and most importantly, maybe not most importantly, uh, let's say as important, is an increase in social capital. Um, and, and that's where that intentional friendship comes in. Um, you know, you, you, I'm sure you would recognize in your own life um, when certain things happen or you have certain needs, there are friends you call that have experiences that, that can help you um, know how to deal with them. What we know from, with folks that are experiencing poverty is, is most of their network um, uh, are also experiencing poverty themselves. And so some of the solutions that we would look to, they may not have experience in. So that social capital piece, that increase in social capital piece is really important.
So uh, it's, it is an amazing initiative and, and we've seen great results. And we're at a point where we're starting our fourth cohort at Buncombe Street, uh, which is our only site at the moment. Um, it's been phenomenal for the members of our congregation um, as, as allies. And it's been phenomenal for the leaders that have, um, that have led their families out of poverty as well. Um, so uh, there are more than one way, um, there, there's multiple ways that we could see um, the community engaging in this as we expand. Um, one way, obviously, is that we, we need more sites, right? So just like Bunkup Street has done, you could um, start a circle site at a, at a church or a, a community program or, or a, um, a community club in, in any, you know, lots of different ways. Um, uh, but another is that um, is really a little bit more focused on, on um, an, an economic mobility pathway. And so what that looks like is um, we're starting a, our first site with the, um, with the, in a partnership with a company in Anderson. Um, they're a, um, a long-term veterans care facility, and they have lots of healthcare workers, um, lots of CNAs. Um, so this, this data is a little bit dated, but, but um, the, the poverty line for a family of four in South Carolina used to be right around $24,500, right? Um, probably a little bit different today with some of the stimulus and different things, but, but probably not terribly far from that, right? A family of four, if you were $24,500 or below in, in your household income, you were considered in poverty. If you were above that, you were out of poverty, right? So we set a target at 200% of the federal um, poverty guideline to say, look, we, we probably have enough uh, income to, to have savings and to and be able to plan forward a little bit and, and, and truly emerge from poverty and not fall back into a cycle of crisis that would, you know, that would lead to um, fur furthering poverty. So um, if, you, if you think about um, the income that's associated with that, it pretty closely aligns with what a certified nursing assistant would make um, in one of these long-term care facilities. Well, the partner that we're working with on our health care programs in Anderson, um, they are helping to pay for uh, the educational requirements of the tuition to help their CNAs become LPNs. Well, they obviously have a need for LPNs. Their CNAs um, have a desire for increased income, um, and, and so they want to become uh, LPNs, right? So, um, uh, on our um, healthcare programs is paying for the tuition and uh, for these CNAs to become LPNs. What they need is support um, that we can provide uh, with allies. So we're partnering with, um, with HHCP and we're going to stand up a, a circle site with allies that can uh, basically, basically become that intentional friend, that mentor to help them as they're um, going through the, you know, the educational requirements to become LPNs, but provide the, some of the emotional and, and social capital support to give them the support they need in order to, to realize success. As you imagine, uh, the, the CNAs that are working in this program are already working full-time jobs. They have families, and now they're going to go to school. They, they need some emotional support as well. And so um, that's another way that, that I think um, we see this um, working and maybe very powerfully. Um, we are in a, a community that's rich with um, uh, that, that wants to help. We're also a, a community that's uh, uh, rich with opportunity, uh, as you heard John talk about, with the industries that we have. Um, so, uh, you know, for us, no matter how you, you look at this, whether it's you, you look at it, one, as, as a moral imperative, because we have tens of thousands of, of community members that are experiencing poverty, or whether you look at this as an economic wellness imperative, um, it, it's real, right? And so we have a need for um, to support our um, the, the opportunities we have uh, that I experience in my own business, right? I have 100 employees and I need more employees and, and I look for a, um, a labor, labor force to help us support it. So, um, you know, we can certainly um, come alongside um, uh, a business that's looking to provide some, some incentive and some um, educational help to help um, help their employees advance their skills so that they can see opportunities in the industry and provide them with, uh, with the support through circles as well. So I think those are the two, two big ways that we really see um, uh, opportunities here for, for us to, to look at expanding circles in Greenville. One would just be standing up a site within a church or some other type of, of, of uh, location, which we can, we have a, um, a launch team um, that's part of our, our planning committee that can come in and help, help set up um, uh, a, a new site, um, provide all the uh, support to set up a new site. So that's one way. The second would be um, if you can think through opportunities for, um, for an economic mobility model where we can stand up a, a circle site like we're doing with HHCP that's where an industry may be providing um, 
some educational support um, and has a, a job um, that, that's at the back end of that that they can help people move into, we can provide some, some intentional friendship and some allies to help them through that process, kind of stay motivated, um, deal with some struggles that may come along the way and, and help them make make good, solid uh, choices and plans to, to help realize that, that success. That is great information. I went ahead and put the website in the chat and Deandra's put her contact information there too. So a lot of good uh, community partners on the, on the call that could uh, reach out to you. Right. And there's this really great videos too um, on the website that are very uh, story driven, very emotional and um, great work from on the allies part kind of mentoring. Yeah. Thank you so much. We really appreciate everyone being here. I'm going to turn it back over to Mayor Roberts to close us out. Great. Thank you. For your, the last time. Yes. Thank you, Justine. This is our last tech chat of the year. And, and actually, my last one is chair of the board. And so um, it's hard to believe it's been two years, but uh, We've done 3,282 Zoom meetings. Uh, I'm just teasing. Uh, it's been a lot. It seems like not it's far been, off. Yeah, <laughs> probably not far off. But um, I think it's a great way of connecting. Um, today we heard, in my opinion, um, two topics on both ends of the spectrum. Um, but again, two topics that make the upstate of South Carolina a special place. And I appreciate all the information that I, I learned. And, audience learn today. So um, early December, um, tomorrow is 70 degrees. Uh, <laughs> I am playing golf. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going to take advantage of the 70 degrees. But I hope everybody has a good weekend and has a good holiday season. Thank you. Have a good day.